Welcome to the second part of the lecture of today. We are still dealing with net radiation as the main driver of the surface energy balance. Well, but now we're going to have a look at the long wave part of it. And first we're going to have a look at the simple situation where we only have a clear sky. So there are no clouds and our starting point then would be logically the Stefan Boltzmann's equation because the atmosphere has a temperature above absolute zero. So probably it will emit, emit radiation. And well, a typical uh, temperature of the atmosphere would be somewhere around 270, 280, 290 uh, Kelvin. So that's the Planck curve that you see here. And so our first idea would be, okay, the incoming long wave radiation would simply be Stefan Boltzmann's constant times the air temperature to the power of four. But things are a little bit more complex because the atmosphere is not a black body, uh, but its emissivity is a very strong function of the wavelength. And to the left, you see the emission uh, spectrum of the atmosphere, which is, as we've seen before, composed of the emission spectra of the various gases in the atmosphere. And so it's not simply Stefan Boltzmann's equations, but we need to put a uh, emissivity in front. And in principle, we should take into account that the emissivity is a complex function of the wavelength. But what we do is, well, we introduce an apparent emissivity. And actually, it's just weighing the emissivity as a function of the wavelength with the intensity of the Planck curve. So the emissivity pattern uh, as a function of wavelength in the center of the Planck curve has the largest impact on the apparent emissivity. So this is what it would look like. And, but then the question is, can we make a model for this emissivity? And to a large extent, the composition of the atmosphere is relatively constant. So also the emissivity pattern is uh, constant. But water vapor is the most variable uh, gas in the atmosphere. So it would be logical to make the uh, apparent emissivity of the atmosphere a function of the amount of water vapor. And so that is the empirical model that we often use, where there are two constants involved and we take the apparent emissivity as a function of the uh, partial pressure of water vapor. And usually we use the water vapor content close to the surface for that. And later on we will see that that's a reasonable assumption. Well. Just to summarize, the incoming long wave radiation is a complex function of, well, first the temperature of the atmosphere. Well, that's not the complex part because the Planck curve we know quite well. But the complexity comes from the emissivity, uh, which is a strong function of the composition of the atmosphere and of wavelength. And so if you see what is the um, radiation, the spectral composition of the radiation that uh, arrives at the Earth's surface, we see that there it looks like a Planck curve, but there's a big hole in between, which we call the atmospheric window. And the tails on both sides are quite well filled. Well, we have seen that the long wave radiation is a complex function of the composition of the atmosphere. But where does the long wave radiation at the surface actually come from? And to study that, what I did here is I just subdivide the atmosphere in a number of layers. And of course, the atmosphere is a continuum, but let's simplify it to a number of layers. And the, what we see here is the emission spectrum at layer one uh, of the atmosphere. So if we have a gas there and it has a temperature well above zero, it will emit long wave radiation. And it will do so at the wavelength where the emission spectrum is close to one. So these are the arrows showing the emission uh, of this layer. And part of the emission goes downward towards the surface and another part goes upward into the atmosphere. And actually the downward facing arrows, that is simply the incoming long wave radiation at the surface. But is this the only location where it comes from? Well, let's see what the fate of this uh, radiation is. So actually the downward facing uh, radiation arrives at the surface and the upward facing uh, radiation goes to the next layer. But if we have an emissivity close to one for a certain wavelength, that also means that the absorptivity is close to one. So that means that the radiation 
emitted by layer one is absorbed in layer two and there it heats up the atmosphere so the temperature changes and that means that layer two also is going to emit long wave radiation downward and upward and the downward radiation is actually absorbed in uh, layer one and layer one also absorbs the upward welling radiation that comes from the surface and so it goes on and on so now layer three has uh, received radiation um, but that's going to emit it again and this radiation is going partly to the next layer and to the previous layer and so on and so on and now it seems as if this is a cascade of uh, cause and result but actually this results in an equilibrium so actually you should only look at the picture as you see it now where we see emission that goes upward and downward and the next layer and the previous layer uh, absorb that radiation and in the end you get an equilibrium uh, where you have a certain uh, stratification of temperature that uh, is uh, consistent with this equilibrium. Still the important message here is that the radiation that for instance was emitted by layer 2 never arrives at the surface but because before it can get there it has been absorbed already by layer one and that means that all of the radiation that arrives at the surface actually comes from layer one which is the lower part of the atmosphere so that means that uh, to understand the downward uh, long wave radiation at the surface it's probably good enough to know something about the temperature and humidity composition of that layer close to the surface. Well, this is one part, but there's still a big hole in our emission spectrum. And so the question is, what's happening there? Well, if there's a hole in the emission spectrum, there's also a hole in the absorption spectrum. And within this atmospheric window, as we call it, anything that was emitted well above layer three can arrive at the surface. So if we would have something that uh, emits radiation inside at a wavelength inside the atmospheric window, that would just penetrate through the atmosphere. So to understand the effect of clouds on incoming long wave radiation, there are three things we should take into account. As we've seen before, the clear sky contribution is only located at those, those wavelengths where we have emission lines. The clouds will contribute inside the atmospheric window as we will see, see later on because that is where uh, long wave radiation can penetrate through the atmosphere from the clouds down to the surface and very importantly what you see in this uh, figure is that the maximum of the Planck curve for typical atmospheric temperatures is exactly located inside the atmospheric window so if there are clouds uh, they emit long wave radiation at quite a high uh, em emission uh, right inside the wavelength of the atmospheric window. Well, let's see how it looks. So this is the clear sky conditions. We have roughly two contributions for the incoming long wave radiation from the two broad emission bands above the atmospheric window and below the atmospheric window. But what's happening if we add clouds to the picture? So again, for a cloudy situation we still have this radiation and if, as we have seen before if there's any long wave radiation emitted at a higher position in the atmosphere it will never reach the surface because it has been absorbed already before it gets there but the clouds they behave as black bodies and that means that they also emit radiation inside the atmospheric window and it's that part of their uh, emission that arrives at the surface so if you compare the cloudless atmosphere and the cloudy atmosphere, a large part of the incoming long wave radiation is the same, the red arrows. But on top of that, there's also the gray arrow for a cloudy atmosphere. So you see that for cloudy conditions, the incoming long wave radiation is larger than for cloudless conditions. Now it's time for a small exercise. We see the diurnal cycle of the incoming long wave radiation for two days. And the question to you is, which of these two days is the sunny day? Is it day A of the solid line or is it day B of the dashed line? 
Well, the sunny day is the day of the dashed line. So it's May 23. And the reason for that, or the reasoning for that, is that the difference between the two days is actually made up by the gray arrow. So for a sunny day, we only have the red part, which is just the emission by the clear atmosphere by the emission lines. But on this cloudy day, in addition to that, we also have the long wave emission from the clouds that penetrates through the atmospheric window. Finally, we make the step to the upwelling long wave radiation as the large, last part of the net radiation. And what I show to the right here is a remote sensing image of a set of agricultural fields uh, showing the surface temperature. And the round uh, structures that you see are actually irrigation pivots. So these are fields that are irrigated by rotating uh, systems. And you see that there's quite some diversity in the surface temperature. It goes from red somewhere in the middle and the irrigated fields have quite low temperatures and the green fields are somewhere in between. And why, why do we see this variability? Well, it has to do, as we've seen in the introductory uh, lecture, has to do with the amount of vegetation that is present, but also the extent to which it's able to evaporate water. So the variation that you see probably is mostly uh, controlled by the presence of vegetation and the presence of water. But why do I show you the surface temperature? Well, this is a remote sensing image. So people haven't gone through the fields just measuring surface temperature with a thermometer. No, they have an instrument that measures the upwelling long wave radiation. And that long wave radiation is in the end converted into a temperature. So it might make sense, and in fact, it simply sounds like applying Stefan Boltzmann. So what this instrument measured was the upwelling long wave radiation. Once you know that, you can, using the law of Stefan Boltzmann, you can determine the surface temperature. But the question is, is it that simple? Most natural surfaces can be approximated as being gray bodies. So that means that their emission of long wave radiation is not simply equal to what you get from Stefan Boltzmann's equation, but you have to include an emissivity. And we use a subscript here, so it's the surface emissivity. Well, the idea of uh, the surface being a gray body actually only holds within a limited uh, wavelength range. And in this case, it's the long wave range because Things like transmissivity, emissivity, and reflectivity are completely different if you would, for instance, go to the uh, short wave wavelength. Uh, as we've seen before in the previous lecture, the reflectivity of a surface uh, in the short wave range is called the albedo. And actually, we have to take into account the effect of reflectivity here for long wave as well. Because if the emissivity is less than one, then that also means that the absorptivity is equal, less than one. And if the absorptivity is less than one, so if a surface does not absorb all of the radiation that is uh, uh, arriving at it, that means that it also reflects a little bit. And assuming that uh, natural surfaces don't transmit any radiation, the reflectivity of a natural surface would be equal to one minus the emissivity. And so if the emissivity is less than one, automatically the reflectivity is larger than zero. Well, if you take that into account, then the total upwelling long wave radiation that comes from a surface is actually made up of the thermal emission. So the thing that we've seen before, plus a little bit of reflected incoming long wave radiation. Well, again, it's time for a small exercise. We have two diurnal cycles showing the upwelling long wave radiation. And the question here is, which of the two days is in this case the sunny day? Is it the solid line uh, A or is it the dashed line B? The question is up to you. Well, in this case, again, it's the dashed line that's the sunny day. But why is that? Well, as we've argued before, the upwelling long wave radiation mainly depends on the surface temperature. Well, and if you have a sunny day, then the surface heats up quite considerably during daytime. 
and actually also cools down considerably during nighttime. So there is a large diurnal cycle in the surface temperature. And that is what is reflected in the dashed line over here. Whereas if you have a cloudy day, the surface temperature is much more even. So there is a little bit of variation, but it's much less than on the sunny day. Well, this brings us to the end of the second part of the lecture of today. And we looked at the two long wave components of net radiation. In the first lecture, we looked at the short wave incoming reflected. Now we looked at the incoming long wave radiation and the outgoing long wave radiation. Well, with respect to the incoming long wave radiation, we have looked at how it depends on the composition of the atmosphere. So we've looked at the emission spectra and we've also noticed that we can summarize that in terms of what we call an apparent emissivity. And this apparent emissivity depends on the amount of water vapor. Furthermore, the incoming long wave radiation, of course, depends strongly on the uh, air temperature. And we've seen that it's mainly the lower part of the atmosphere, say the lower 200 meters of the atmosphere, that determine the incoming long wave radiation at the surface. Because the long wave radiation that's emitted by higher layers is already absorbed by the atmosphere because before it arrives at the surface. Well, we have also looked at the uh, contribution of clouds because they emit long wave radiation at all wavelengths and they penetrate through the atmospheric window. So they are also a main determining factor when it comes to the incoming long wave radiation at the surface. And we looked at the upwelling long wave radiation. Well, it's mainly determined by the surface temperature yes, through Stefan Boltzmann. But we also should take into account that the emissivity of most natural surfaces is not equal to one. So there's also a small contribution to the upwelling long wave radiation that comes from reflected long wave radiation. Well, with these two lectures, we have covered all four components of the net radiation. So hopefully you now have an idea how that varies between different surfaces, between different atmospheric conditions, and how it varies through the day and through the year. That was this for today.